pleasant day to you out there and thank you for coming up on the Cradle TV show on NTA Channel 12 who are you? I am Emmanuel Buffon, your regular host. In today's segment of the show, we are beaming via Zoom to a quintessential who has done more to the people of Akwa Ibom State. I mean the progenitor of social housing, the progenitor of good governance ideology, the progenitor of social governance ideology, not just only in Akwa Ibom State, Nigeria, but the whole world at large. And he is going to talk about the forthcoming 2023 general election and the political scenario of Akwa Ibom State. I know you will know him. He is a thorough breed he need professional. He need no introduction in this regard. He is no other person than architect Ezekiel Njaitu. Thank you for those very interesting remarks and everything. All right, sir. Um, your guest out there may want to um, come into your background. Please, can you shed more light on it? I'm coming to my background. Actually, my name, like you rightly said, is Ezekiel Anie Kanabasi Njaitu. I am an architect and uh, one of the most important titles that I have is that of being Otwe Kong Ikorekwene and you know Ikorekwene is the capital city of Anang land so for you to be an Otwe Kong Ikorekwene is like um, something that I hold very dear and I, 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 I owe it to the paramount ruler of Ikorekwene that's a story that will be told sometime because when I was given that title it was something. It was at a time when the serving um, uh, deputy governor was from Ikodepene, you know, and um, yes, Ikodepene uh, axis. And then the serving commissioner for works, then who became the, the, the next governor, my brother Babio, was there. And then so many other important people, and only one person could be Otu Ekong Ikorepene. And the paramount ruler then uh, believed that he had a foresight, he had an inkling into um, what, uh, what the future holds for Ananglan. And he believed that the decorated general of that Ananglan should be architect Nyaito. So many people, including myself, were, were taken by surprise. But, um, I, I, I believe that um, things are starting to unfold and I'm seeing what the paramount, the late paramount ruler then saw and uh, I, I pray God will help me to live up to what the man saw. Okay, that's it. Uh, and um, I, my mother was the fifth of the five wives and I was number 23 of the 24 children. That's why I said by the time I was born, I was already excess luggage. And then, you know, my, my, my father had, had over 10 male children, so many female children. So uh, by the time I was born, it was like, um, you know, I'll tell you this story, which is, um, I, I, okay, maybe I'll tell you the story somewhere along the line. Um, my, things were not very easy. My, I had one of the most enterprising, uh, persons for a mother, a Kaite Williamian then, you know, she was just a personification of the spirit of enterprise. But things were, things started on a very hard note, so she had to send me to her mother in the village in Bioku Ikorodong. That's actually where I started my life. I attended the primary school there and um, things were hard, really hard. She tried so much. And I used to tell people, I remember trekking from Ikodepene, from, from Bioku to Ikodepene, then we were living at Aba Road, trekking not once, not twice, you know, to come and visit my mom and back. So that's, 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 that's the sort of background I had. When Jonathan said, um, anyway, let me not go into that because it will take a whole lot. Uh, from there, somewhere along the line, around primary three or thereabout, I left and came over to stay with my mother at Ikodepene. That's why I speak Ibibio and I don't speak Anna. You know, so, um, you know, when you're raised by your mother, you, you kind of um, flow well that way. That's why a lot of people don't know where to put me. Am I from Ikono or am I from Ikodepene? Well, my, 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 my father is from Ikodepene. Technically, I'm from there because you're from where your father comes from. But uh, my upbringing, everything about me is more of Ikono. Uh, so that's it. I got into, um, Government Primary School, Ikonobongedong, Ekoi, in, in um, 
in Ikade Pene, obviously. And then that's where I completed my primary education. And something curious happened. One day in class, the, the teacher came in and said there was a common entrance examination to a federal school. And I, I didn't know anything about federal schools or anything. I'd never gone to anywhere. It was just between my village in Biokui Karadung and Ikade Pene. That was the biggest stage I'd been to in the world. So when they talked about these schools, I said, whichever is the best, I want to be there. It was an ambition and a lot of people were like, we want to be the best. I said, yes. And when they looked at who was talking, and they said, the best is Federal Government College, Worry. And um, it, it was then rated the best in West Africa and the ninth best in the Commonwealth. And this, this ambitious village boy, actually filled Federal Government College Worry as his only choice. Uh, they said it was the best and I wanted to go for it. I knew nobody, absolutely nobody. That's why this is the Nigeria that I knew that our young people don't know. The Nigeria of meritocracy. Where the child of a nobody, knowing nobody can become somebody strictly because of one word, excellence. Long story short, I gained admission into Federal Government College Warrior. Till tomorrow, how that happened, only God knows. Nobody knows. Nobody can explain. And my life changed forever. My story in Federal Government College War is a story for another day. It's a story for the movies because um, it's, it's, it's a story that has defined my life. It's a choice I had to make. Either to give up or to press on. Coming from Ikode Pene and where I had never had any interaction with white people or things like that. As a matter of fact, somewhere along the line, we used to go for this cinema by uh, Liver Brothers then. They would go to the stadium and we'd go and watch the, you know, used to be cowboy films then. You know, actor and Batman, you know, John Wayne and all those people. Now, what used to happen is that while the white people were taking all the shh, 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 there would be a man that would interpret what they were saying. Okay, ah, actor don't come or be like, say, no one take this as you see what he will do. Ah, then John Wayne don't fall. You know, they were running commentaries and everything, and we were enjoying that. So, when I got into class in Federal Government College, Worry, and um, you know, to start with, out of 58 staff, 48 were white, and a white man came into the class and started the shoo 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 shoo. My homeboy, a village boy, I expected interpretation. And what did I see? My classmate, my own classmate, seated with me, raised hand. I'm like, what's going on? And he communicated, responded. I'm like, eh? I walk up there. You know, <laughs> you mean he was his my classmate has understood what this guy is saying? Guy was high jump. Because I mean, for me it was shush, 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 shush. and think about it, out of 52, 48 were white. It was a harrowing experience for me to not understand what they were saying, to go back, not give myself up for them to laugh at me, and depend on my classmates, you know, to kind of um, tell me what was going on in class. You know, I could take what I could take. And then there was this very rugged determination for me to to not live where I was. If God had taken me to that place, I was not going to leave. Bottom line, I survived Federal Government College. In fact, at the end of the first year, nobody knew anything about me as being a village boy, a homeboy, I'd integrated. Then we, that's another story. There are so many stories that uh, I don't know how to put them together uh, because the story of how I moved from being a village boy to LSB. LSB means Lagos State Boy, you know? That was a class that time. I became LSB without stepping a foot on Lagos soil. I developed a photographic memory when people are talking. For instance, you say, oh, when I was coming from Victoria Island and going to Ikeja, that, that, that cold up because of the Ojueleba Bridge. It was terrible, man. Ten minutes into the discussion, I seize the narrative and spin it the other way. Oh, when I was moving from uh, Ikeja, going to the island, 
You know, the guy said, hey, you that whole, I said, yeah, it was terrible. I will repeat the things. He will not remember that they are the things he said himself, you know. So I, I could talk about Lagos Island. I could talk about Ikeja. I could talk about Apapa. I could talk about everything. I conquered Lagos. And the next thing was moving into U.S. I could tell you about Washington. I could tell you, move to Paris, tell you about Paris move to London, tell you about you know, the streets of London and everything because so many of the students were children of the richest and the most endowed who were going on vacation every single holiday. Well, which one is vacation? Was school closed? I don't take off to Yukonek Bennett Town and remain there with my mother in her shop where she was selling things. Uh, or I go to Mbioko and stay with the Mark Were, my grandmother. Bottom line was that toughened me, that gave me that can do spirit, and um, I think that is why I've never worked for anybody. I, 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 I moved from there, Federal Government College, Warri, to University of Nigeria, where I did architecture. And um, while I was in secondary school, one man, Dr. Odoidon Ekon, he's late now, helped me you know, paying part of my fees and everything. I was more of an indigent student. By the time I got into university, somewhere along the line, because of the Shagari coup, he was detained. So I had to take care of myself and um, set up so many things. I, I had to pay my fees. I had to do everything about myself, everything. So I, I grew up to know only two people, God and myself, no other person. That explains why I, I have been like that. As a matter of fact, the, the, the company I, I registered in the university to be able to make ends meet is the same company that I'm still working with today. I've never worked for anybody. I've never accepted any paying job. I've never any of these things. And God has blessed me. So I think by way of um, background, um, of course, how do I end my background without talking about this awesome, wonderful, delectable, upwardly mobile, God-fearing, beautiful young lady that I met in school. Talk about ambition again. <laughs> God, there's so much to talk about. She was doing medicine while I was doing architecture. I was a year ahead. So at the end of the day, we dated for about for six years and we've been married for 33 years now. Actually, November 1 will be 34 years, which means by November 1, we would have been together for about 40 years. And um, we have three lovely children. We started early. I was 25 when we wedded. She was 23. So at 45, two of our sons, that was my 45th birthday, uh, two of our sons had graduated from the university. And at 50, the third one graduated, the lady, and then the first child, Akman, also graduated with his master's from University of Manchester. So God has been wonderful to me, and that's about my family. So that's my background in a nutshell. Did I say nutshell? Yeah, nutshell. Thank you. I think that India yeah, took in the last Zoom aspirant debate meeting. You were asked some questions. What is the motive behind your aspiration? So, how did you prepare yourself in the past for this position, or did you just wake up and say, "Oh, I should be a governor"? Because everybody's aspiring for that post. Just tell us. All right. You see, many people don't understand the office of the governor. Many people don't. The governor is, is not somebody that is rewarded. No. The governor is somebody who comes in to carry the weight of the generality of the people. This generality of the people are usually within the DE segment, which is the, the, the poor, the most vulnerable, the physically challenged, the, the, the aged, the rural dwellers, the workers, the students, the children. 
these are the people that government takes care of so whoever comes in to be a governor must feel this weight of responsibility to take care of the masses it's not an ego tripping thing where you enjoy the paraphernalia of the office where you want to talk about yourself it's all about yourself it's about sacrifice you know there's a story in the bible about um you know a certain king who was going to meet his brother and they asked him to like hurry and he said in my camp are children and pregnant women if i overdrive them by a day i might lose some you guys go i'll be coming that is called empathy that's sympathy that's feeling for your subject that is leadership that is the governor now the bible also says that we do not have a high priest that is not touched by the feelings of our infirmities the bible says that he's gone through what we are going through so he's able to understand you know now that is extremely instructive what is it in my background that has made me to identify with the poor so much for almost 30 years of my life i devoted it to social housing and god rewarded me with being able to make social housing a national policy in nigeria and nigeria turned around gave me housing man of the year gave me lifetime achievement in housing because they saw the sacrifices the way i doggedly handled this and the fact that social housing is not an enterprising thing for an architect to do but i put in and i followed it up from the beginning to the end and then i took up social governance it's because i understand what it means to be poor i've lived it and many of us live in denial look at what's happening to our educational system the people that are destroying education today are the people that benefited from public schools tell me how many of the governors the president the ministers the commissioners went to private schools most of us 90 percent went to public schools and what have we done in return killed public schools so that's living in denial i don't want to be a victim of that I, I see me living with my grandmother in the village. I see me going to school and coming back from school to stay. I'm just picturing that mud touch a house. I'll come back and all I was hearing was the bleeding of the goats, the noise of the chicken. And I'll shout, Mark, where it, Mark, where it, Mark, where it. That is my grandmother. She's gone to the farm. I need to be able to identify which of the farms that she went to to be able to go and meet her. She would tell me, oh, that the food is in this place or that or wait, when we are through, we'll go back together or yeah, maybe roast this yam and be eating meanwhile because she was such a caring. She knew somewhere along the line I'll come, especially if she was in the nearby farms. But if she was going to the further farm, she would either leave instruction for me before I come from school and tell me where it is. So what am I trying to say? I, 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 I know what it means, you know, to live that life. I know what it means to go and be, be, be indigent in the midst of plenty, which is exactly what is happening in Akwaibom today. People cannot find food to eat. People are finding it difficult to, to feed their family, to, to pay school fees, to even drivers are now sending their children to private schools think about it drivers because the public schools are almost completely run down do you understand me so I, I i can identify with these things and i'm asking myself is not okay look at the poor in in a quiet bone are absolutely poor and what do they see this 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 display of this immoral this i don't even know the word to use display of wealth get into shelter africa when you get into shelter africa you don't understand look at the way they throw money around you know and and they just throw it on your face in a way that is so demeaning to you 
we've almost become dehumanized. And where is this money coming from? So I think that the time has come when we have to redefine what government and governance is all about. We need to come and draw a line between a commissioner and architect Nyaito. So what do you mean by that? Architect Nyaito is a private businessman who does his business, who makes his money and spends the way he wishes. Depending on how God-fearing he is, because we are God-fearing, the Bible says it's God that gives you power to make wealth, that he might establish his covenant. So you know that this money is from God. So you go back to God and say, how do I use it? But I can use my money any way I want. You can't as a commissioner. You can't as a governor because it's not your money. We need to let every public servant know that that money belongs to the generality of the people. That mindset, that mentality in government and governance must be changed. Those are the things that are driving me into government because we can't continue this way. A man that was with you five years ago in the same flat with you. In fact, you can remember when you helped him to complete his rent. Suddenly becomes a commissioner. Go and look at the house he's living in Shelter Africa within five years. Go and look at the house. And what is his salary? It's not okay. It's not okay. We can't just keep thinking it doesn't matter. It matters. It's not okay. Those are the things that are doing me. And, and, and I'm willing to give the very best of me. You know, I, I could talk for the next five hours on this matter. Some people have said, what's going on? I said, the Bible says, Ezekiel, in the book of Ezekiel to start with, says, I make you a watchman over the city. When the enemy comes, raise an alarm. If the people run and save themselves, you've done well. If they refuse to run and whatever meets them, meets them as their own business. But if you refuse to raise an alarm and then this evil comes on them, he said, their blood I'll require of you. We all know what's going on today. I'm coming out here to raise an alarm risking the comfort of my family, risking what I've worked for for so long, risking my reputation, risking being laughed at, you know, I've decided to come and do my, my, my best and to raise the alarm and say, we can't continue governance this way, we can't. The long convoy of the governor has to stop, we can't continue. The, 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 the obscene display of affluence and wealth in government has, has to stop, we can't continue this way. We can't continue to have certain things in certain places, government house, government lodge, and all this is in other places, Abuja, and we don't have money to pay the workers living wage. No, we've got to shut down. We've got to go low profile. Those are the things that are brought. And the Bible says again, when you go to preach, if they accept you, fine. If they don't, shake the dust off your feet and move. That's what I'm doing. And I believe better things of acquired on people that they will listen. We are good people. We've just been misled for so long. We've always been looking for someone that can stand and say, let's go in this direction. I've decided to be that person. And trust me, from what I've seen, acquired on people are amazing. We will give these people a surprise, a root shock. Because anybody that thinks an acquired on person is dumb, cannot think, hey, well, oh, this is my party. I think no day again. I'm going to, who are you? I think in the course of the discussion, we'll go more into that. All right, sir. You've always um, described yourself as a giver and not a taker. Please, can you expatiate on that? Um, what do you mean by that? Is there anybody that exists without taking and keep on giving, giving, giving? Let's understand you, sir. Ah, that's a very, very, very... In fact, it's something that I really thanks for this opportunity. Very, it's important to me, very, very important to me. There are two sets of people. When people talk, I just look at them and is it that they are playing the ostrich thinking that people don't know? Guy, what, what did you do to be made a commissioner, to be made a chairman, to be made part of a board? Did you not pray fast, do this, do that? Did they come to beg you? No. Some of you even consulted native doctors. appointment. And the evidence is as clear as day. Overnight, you blow. Overnight, you are a taker. You are a taker. You they collect. You are they collect. 
So don't tell me, you know, I've been, I've been counselor, I've been commissioner, I've been this, and that qualifies you to be a governor. You have been taken. Akwaibon wants to ask you, what have you given? What have you given? I will tell you what I've given. Without any appointment, I brought Shelter Free. Go and find out the story of Shelter Free. It could have gone to, luckily for me, my brother, Okonobot, architect Okonobot, who was a commissioner then, is still alive. My boss, architect Obong Victor Atta, is still alive. Even my brother, Akanokon, that followed me to Nairobi to sign the contract, is still alive. My brother, Efion Bob, who was the distinguished senator, Efion Bob, who was the attorney general then, was alive. None of them will tell you that they saw none. The proposal that gave us the millions of dollars from Shelter Africa, that proposal, no. I got it and I brought it to a quite state. My governor is aware, he's alive. That project could have gone to any state in the Federation. My governor that I hold in highest esteem is alive, he will tell you. I brought Shelter Africa. Luckily, why did I bring to Aquaibo? How did this happen? It's because I had a man in architect, Obong Victor Atta, who was not just a former president, national president of the Nigerian Institute of Architects. He was somebody that was God-fearing, somebody that was principled, somebody that was knowledgeable, was exposed, and everything. So I was better off with him. And man, tell me this. Without that man, we wouldn't have been able to do this project because I was just green. I was 37 years. I had little exposure, little, I, all I had was this dogged determination. So the governor was not just a governor, he was more like a, a project advisor to me because he was the one that was guiding me throughout. So, Shelter Africa, I brought Shelter Africa. In the year 2000, people don't know this, that decoration of that Ibom connection or, uh, by Plaza, I think it's Ibom connection, no, Ibom connection is the one. Uh, the one the one by plaza that whole decoration was in government in the year 2000 i asked myself how are we going to do entire year 2000 let's let's brighten what can i do what can i do i went to alaba bought the lights bought the decorations went to uh, uh, Aba, bought generator hired a man and set up that whole thing the lighting the decorations everything it was in the government contract it was a private money that I put down from my pocket and hired one old man who would go there by 6 o'clock, he lived next door to the place, he would turn on the generator, turn on the light and everything. By 12 o'clock, he would turn it off and take the generator back and keep it safe. I, I, I did that. I was not holding any appointment. I was not any, no, I was just a citizen that cared about a quiet home state. Apart from that, not long ago, there was the CR1 um, project by Amnesty International, uh, not Amnesty Nigeria, uh, Ministry of, um, what do they call it? The Amnesty Office, anyway, in, in Nigeria. And they wanted to do something for the Niger Delta state, I mean, obviously, being the Amnesty program. And all the Niger Delta states were to be camped, were to look for young children, not young, young stars, and do football academy that was integrated with education and everything. And they were going to run for about maybe four to six months. And I said, why shouldn't this be in Akwaibo? Why would they take it to any other state? But something Siasia is alive. He was the face of the project. That's why they call it Sia One. And God helped me as an individual to bring it to Akwaibo. When we had a press conference, there were over 30 journalists at um, Ibom, you know, then was Le Meridian. And something Siasia said it on record. And he doesn't know how architect Yaito was, that he is the face of the project. And it's, of, it's going to Bielsa. Yaito came from nowhere and has been able to get the project to come to Akwaibo. And they were here, all of them from all the Niger Delta states. They were camped here, maybe about 50 or so uh, children from each of the, uh, not children, you know, footballers. There was a talent, a talent hunt thing, you know. And they, they were here in Akwaibo state. The hotels were. The, the, we got the money for the hotels, the food, the relationships, the friendships, everything. It was something. And my brother Monde Uko was the commissioner, he's still the commissioner. You can ask him. He was gracious enough through the state government. They were kind enough to give us a stadium to use 
throughout that period they didn't charge a dime so i need to give credit to the uh, my brother udom's administration they cooperated do you understand me but i was able to bring it to this place now that is giving it's not taking and in taking i want to say that i challenge anybody to give me five jobs i've done since acquired bone state was created since acquired bone state was created during the time of my my Oga obong victor attack i did shelter africa project during the time of my brother akbabio i supervised a housing project supervised the 1000 housing unit during the time of my brother Udom, I've not done nothing. I've not held any post. I've not done any contract. He's still alive. So it's easy to say, ah, oh, Yaito is not true. I've not, you know? So if you, maybe there's one or two I've forgotten, but I think you can hardly bring out five things since Akwai Bumstead was created. So you you that have been a commissioner, have been a member of house, have been this, you are takers, takers. Tell me what you have given as an individual, as a giver, to show your love for this country. And let me even say this. My office has always been here in Akwaibo because of what I do. Though I live in, Akwa, in, 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 um, in Abuja, my office has been here because architectural designs and everything is what you can do online and um, you know share screen and everything. So I've been employing people here every year, every year, sons and daughters of this state i've been doing them here i am a giver in terms of employment look at the estate that i'm doing right now i'm sure you might be able to get um, you know clips of it and show that estate is an acquired i brought the federal government presence the whole the roads have been asphalted two transformers 500 kva water treatment treatment plant fire hydrant i i brought it as an individual by the grace of god and then there is something about about the 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 onshore offshore um, dichotomy and the, the judgment and how we got to have our 13% derivation. I played one of the most sensitive, one of the most strategic, you know, roles. People don't know about this. Maybe as time as time permits, uh, I will be able. Let me let me just hit it direct. My brother. My architect, Obon Victor Atta, is alive. My brother, Anie Tiyuse, is alive. My brother, um, um, Pachumo, he was the Commissioner of Information then, is alive. And of course, my very, very great friend, Michael Bush, is alive. These people know that I don't know what they know, but my governor knows. Architect Obama Victor Atta, he's still alive. When ah, and this lady, I will remember her name. She was the M, the MD of NTA. Uh, I remember her name not long ago. Uh, the, the the MD of NTA, uh, Uyo, she's alive. You know what happened? Because of my relationship with the presidency, I knew that. Architect Obon Victor Atta was being isolated as, you know, being troublesome and just carrying on and when Akwaibom people were not, you know, they just tried to, to isolate him from Akwaibom people and that he was because, man, did that man fight. He fought for resource control. He took the presidency and Nigeria. And what they had to do was to isolate him and make it look like he was just on his own. I said, no, he's an Akwaibom fight. I ran down to Akwaibom and talked to the government, one, two people, then ran down to Lagos, ran back to Lagos, and got the late Amaka Igwe. She owned the best studio in Nigeria as at that time. She had everything. I told her, Amaka, you've been my friend. I want you to do something for me. She said, what? I said, you need, I want you to move your studio to Uyo. I want us to have a program that we're going to run daily for at least 30 days. She laughed at me and said, Ezekiel, it's impossible to move this studio. I have a crew of about 20 people, if nothing else. For what you want to do, you need, let's record here and take it. I said, no, I need the people in the state to enter the place. I won't be able to do that. And we're going to be doing it every night. Bottom line, Amaka agreed reluctantly because she saw the zeal, the determination, and she believed in the cause. Amaka moved her station. 
everything I paid for everybody the flight everything the crew I brought them to Aquaibom we camped them in Aquaibom everything was paid by me from my pocket and we started the program you know the program our destiny that's why I called my brother Anie Tusen. he was part of the committee my brother Pachumo my brother Michael Bush these are all the people who are still alive they were part they contributed and we had everybody my distinguished senator Udo Udoma uh, was there even it was so great that even my late Oga a. Marshall Edward, who had a very bitter relationship with our governor, you know, upon at that then. When I told him, because the governor gave me government house to use one big full story building. When he came in and saw everything, he was impressed. But you see, he thought it was like the ministry of, you know, just an arm of government doing it and everything. At the end of the day, when I talked to my, 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 my late Oga A. Marshall Edward, Say, sir, this is our project. We can't. You, you, you love Aquaibo more than personal disagreement. He said, Ezekiel, I'll do it anyway. I'm not going to the government house. I said, sir, you're going to go to government house. And you'll do it. You know, that, that is the privilege when older people see your honesty, see your zeal, and respect you for who you are. A. Marshall Edward left personal difference, came there. He recorded so many anybody that was somebody that program started airing every night every night every night and this is the part people don't know my sister is still alive you can ask her ben bruce someone her that she's been given instruction to stop that program that if that program goes on air this night she'll be fired she is still alive you can ask her she had to call me from abuja my brother I had not only paid for the production, paid for the crew, paid for everything. I had paid for eight time on NTA every night. And they were running it and then, you know, they had to refund me 500,000 Naira of my money. They had to refund me. Because the president's meet was completely demystified. It showed that resource control was not the, the fight of an isolated man who was being recalcitrant and just being troublesome and difficult. But it was he was the champion of the cause of the people. Everybody spoke with one voice. That program was so impactful that the presidency had to is demand an immediate stop to it. That was how how impactful it was. I paid for that program. One day, architect Obama Victor, I don't know how the discussion was going. God bless that man. I respect him so much. So he was talking about it, and I said, Your Excellency, yet born now, come here, my money is thin because of this. And he was like, Because of what? I said, He said, What are you talking about? You paid for that program? I said, Yes, I did. What do you mean? He was he was almost livid. How can you say so? How can you say you paid for it? I thought it was a no. He he instructed there and then. They brought the hotel bills, the flight fare, everything. It came to close to 8 million naira. He said, refund. The other ones, consultancy or this and all those other people, blah, 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 no problem. But how can an individual spend his personal money on this sort of a matter? I did. I am a giver to the Quaibon project. There are so many other things on my birthday that my brother talked about. I brought my friends. While people were taking things out, I was bringing my friends. I decided to give 58 scholarships because I was turning 58. But then, my brother and friend, Alaji Kwankwaso, came, he flew down. He gave four university scholarships, start to finish. My brother, uh, Wale Adewale, from US, zoomed in. He said he's giving eight secondary school scholarships by the time my friends brought in their support we could give over 100 people scholarships I'm bringing people in they are taking our money out these are the things we have to sit down and interrogate you want to be governor no problem they come and tell me whether you are a giver 
or you are a taker. If you are a taker, you are just going to come and take and take and take and take and grab and leave us where we are today in penury. A state that has an annual budget of over 500 billion for the past eight plus seven, about 15 years. Look at Wangiba, you call it Benin Road, Oron Road, Abag Road, Aka Road, you know. Show me the corporate office. This is the spine of Akwa Ibom State. Show me the people of Akwa Ibom State that have utilized this over 8 to 10 trillion. Put it 7.5 trillion. It's not okay. We can't, we can't pretend that it's okay. It's not okay. It's not okay. We've got to start to ask questions. So this issue of big party, I'm in PDP, I'm APC, I'm this and that, that myth has to come to an end. No party rules you, individuals rule. As of today, who is who is who is who is governing you in Aquaibo? PDP. Be honest with yourself. PDP. No. Dikinuto Imano. Before him was one man, my brother Akbabio. Before him, it was one man, my brother Atta. At the time of my Oga Atta, not my brother, my Oga. At the time, at his time, things were more liberal. But think of it that it's about one person, one person. It's not party. So when we all come, if you want to give the governorship to a giver, that's your business. If you want to give it to a taker, see what if you're only a yakum. Just know that it's your decision to take. It's not about party, it's about who the person is. So these are all the things that have have um, have moved me to say play your role. It's not enough for me to just be complaining, eh, if this is that that no. What as you are now, if you can't enter and contest, look for somebody and support. Effective support. Effective support. All those who want to be, look for one of them and throw your weight behind it because you believe in it. At the end of the day, it's going to be a root shock. Too. Root shock. Wait. 2023. But in the campaign, never start. Never reach. I next say no start to campaign. So we are waiting. By the time we finish these primaries, candidates emerge like I will emerge. <laughs> I will. You know what happened? My at the Congress, my party unanimously. It was, it was, it was, it was, it was, it was, it was so moving. It was so, so emotional. I didn't know that. I knew that my people appreciate things, but. The way that it happened, spontaneous, I neck was there, everybody. By the time we finished the state congress, one man just rose up. He said he wants to raise emotion. That we have seen how this party has come from nowhere, what has been done, blah, 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 everything. We want to raise emotion that this, we should, this man should be adopted as a sole candidate for our party, for the governorship election. And it was, it was, it was, it was, it was like, I, I, don't, I don't know. It was like, um, what's the expression? The, the spontaneous reaction was so emotional. Everybody shouted, yes, 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 yes. One, one man was, <laughs> excuse me, one man was so excited. He just burst into, into a song. Anemio, ADC, Anemio, come over. Anemio, ADC, Anemio, come Everybody joined in and... And that song was so inspired because not only was it joyous, but it, 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 it kind of captured what politicking is all about, the logo of the party. You know, Komubo Handshake is the, is, the, you know, is the logo of the party. So that is the story. I hope we'll have some more time to continue. Uh, Ima, I think you may have to uh, help me at this point and take over while I face other things. But to the people of Akwaibom State, Mumidem Kama, bet 2023, you'll be happy. God bless you all. I want to believe that you are inspired. I want to believe that you are motivated. Well, I was touched. You were touched? Yes. Wow. How a man would do something for a state that's been very patriotic. 
To me, it's a um, selfless service to humanity. To me, it's as a result of where he is coming from, his humble beginning, and he is passionate to see an average acquired boom from a poor home succeeding to me i think that is um his motive behind wanting to be the governor of a quiet state did you listen to him he was backing all his um achievements and works he's been doing with the bible oh, wow. wow that might be touch and i think um, it's really really embedded with the scriptural standpoint in everything he does as i think it is a christian to the core i don't think so okay we will find out that um Keep a date with us, same time, same station, same time. Bye. Bye. We'll come your way next week.